Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I've been waiting a long time to introduce this guest to you, and I cannot wait to share. But uh, before I do, I want to thank some folks that we always thank. We want to thank Brass and Winds.com, a Quinn the Eskimo company. When we're looking for brass and woodwind instruments, we always talk to brassandwinds.com first. They're fine people. They've been very helpful to us and supportive, and we want to do the same for them. Please give them a, a ring or check them out at brassandwinds.com. If you're looking for a better way to learn the piano, try truermu.com. Uh, there's online lessons on jazz instruction and soon to be instruction on how to teach beginners the piano. If you'd like to study with a person, check us out at Willow Music. Willow Music, that's willowschoolga.com. Uh, we're a better way to learn music and we have instruction in woodwind and brass instruments as well as the piano, the guitar, and the drums. Come check us out at willowschoolga.com. And that sound indicates that we have a caller, but we're not going to answer that call. <laughs> <laughs> Every time on this show, uh, at the beginning, I introduce BrassandWinds.com as a company that we trust. Um, and today I want to introduce you to the founder of BrassandWinds.com, the director, the owner, uh, the man who makes it happen. His name is Matt Stecker. Matt, uh, hello. Welcome to our show. Hi, Adam. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on your show. Uh, it's my pleasure. I've been wanting to talk to you on the show for a long time. Now, uh, your background is fascinating, and I want to give people an overview of it before we talk. Uh, you uh, studied at Oberlin College, a world-class conservatory, with two of the finest trombonists in the world, Per Brevig and Ray Premru. And one would think that with a background like that, you'd go into music professionally full-time. You instead got a PhD in microbiology at the University of Washington. And one would think with a resume like that that you'd go into science full-time. Instead, you are the founder of a very successful company called BrassandWinds.com. What a fascinating journey. Can you start by telling us how you got here? Yeah, you know, this has been a really um, bizarre and convoluted trip, but I'm, I'm glad I took it. Uh, so it really all goes back to um, one studio class at Oberlin uh, after spring break when a fellow by the name of Lance Gaskill, who was a studio mate of mine and a, a fine trombonist, uh, came back from, um, from uh, spring break with a, tr a trombone that he'd purchased in a pawn shop. It was in a Con 88H uh, from the, uh, what I know now to be the, the famous Elkhart period. Uh, and these instruments uh, are fairly legendary. They are amazing instruments. And when he let me play it, uh, I had never played an instrument like that in my life. And I was playing a very nice Bach 42 at the time, but this just seemed to have such easy response that I really wanted to get one for myself. And uh, the problem was uh, these instruments hadn't been manufactured in Elkhart at that point in time anyways, uh, for about 30 years. Uh, so to find one from this vintage, uh, you couldn't go to a, a music store and, and buy one. You, you had to find a used one, and that meant pawn shops. And so I sort of started this hobby of going around to pawn shops looking for this particular trombone. And, uh, um, you know, fast forward to being in graduate school, uh, and I'm, you know, working and, and living on a, uh, um, a stipend of about $12,000 a year uh, for, for my uh, annual expenses, you know, living, food, all that kind of stuff. And I, would, I was going to pawn shops and I, I was not finding this instrument that I wanted to find, but I kept finding other instruments that I wasn't real interested in, but I knew I could sell and maybe make a little money. And, you know, if I made $100 selling something, that was real money to me back then. I mean, that was like pizza every Friday for a month. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I, I got real interested in doing that. And I, it, I started spending nearly every weekend I had just going around the pawn shops in the area, scouring them, trying to find deals. And uh, that hobby just kind of snowballed. And then um, yeah, around that time, eBay happened and became a place uh, to reach uh, customers um, and, uh, and sell things. Um, around that time, I graduated uh, with my PhD and went to work for a local biotech company that um, didn't really do so well, unfortunately. And uh, after about a year and a half, I was laid off uh, through just because uh, our sales weren't uh, um, what we wanted them to be. And I ended up taking a job at Microsoft, um, where I uh, 
because I, 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 I'd always had some base, base level of computer programming skills. Um, and I was hired as um, what's called a programming writer. And what that, what that means is someone who writes documentation about the programming languages. So I wasn't writing Microsoft programs themselves, but I was writing documentation for the tools that you use to write programs. So I improved my, uh, my computer programming skills there, and that sort of interfaced and allowed me to make some tools that made it easier to work with, with eBay, this growing um, marketplace, which also allowed me to source more equipment or more materials. And the, uh, the hobby just snowballed until one day I realized I was waking up, spending a couple of hours a morning on emails, going to Microsoft, working eight to 10 hours a day, uh, coming home and uh, spending the rest of the time on my hobby until I went to bed and repeating every single day. And I thought, well, this isn't going to work, so I've got to pick one. Uh, so I, I picked my hobby. And, and we have another caller. <laughs> yeah. Let me I'll take call advantage. Back. Let, me, let me take advantage of the interruption to ask you a question, which is right along sure. the line of your story. What was the, how, how did you know it was time to quit Microsoft? What was the clue? I mean, you told me in a big picture, but was there a day? There was actually. Um, I, uh, I went on this wonderful vacation. Um, so it was, it was a, a biking vacation through Tuscany. And it was the best vacation I'd ever been on. It was so great. And I had such a great time. And, uh, you know, we're biking around. We're eating fine Italian food. We're drinking wine. It was wonderful. And I got back home, and the first day back at work, I was uh, <laughs> like this. This glow I had from the vacation did not last a single day, <laughs> and that's when I realized it was maybe time for me to move on. Nice. Um, and I, I left the company about a month later. Yeah. Were you scared? Um, a little bit, but to be honest, at that point, uh, my hobby was. Uh, making me more money than my salary at Microsoft was. Oh wow! So, um, so I was knew, yeah safe to jump. I knew it was going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, so it, it it worked out. And we went through. We did go through some scary bits. I mean, that was that was in 2007, right before the giant uh, collapse of the uh, um, of uh, the housing market. And uh, um, you know, we were. Uh, um, we, we paradoxically actually had a pretty good year that year, believe it or not, um, which, uh, uh, you know, I won't go into the reasons why, but, but it was interesting. Um, but we've, uh, um, we've sort of weathered a few storms and have continued to grow. And uh, over, the, over the course of the next few years, um, we, we grew and we developed, um, you know, developed our company. And in, I think it was 2000... 14, yeah, it was 2014 or maybe 2013. We we actually started working with uh, the major manufacturers of musical instruments uh, to start selling uh, new and uh, and their demo uh, instruments. Uh, so we uh, um, we now have uh, relationships with uh, companies such as Yamaha, Con Selmer, uh, KHS Jupiter, uh, the Buffet Group. And St. Louis Music, uh, as well as with uh, um, you know some smaller companies such as Theo Wane mouthpieces, uh, Rafael Navarro mouthpieces, uh, etc. And so we, uh, um, through these relationships, were able to do volume purchases of of fine, high quality instruments and uh, get them to our customers at really great prices. Everybody who has a business would like to be able to connect with the big folks, uh, and you did it. Um, how did that come about? I, I'm really not sure, actually. <laughs> um, I, I think I just uh, I think I just charmed my way into the into the meeting <laughs> rooms. Um, I do remember one the meeting with the first company that um, that actually took us on as a dealer. Um, I remember the phone call meeting with the uh, the customer. Um, the customer service rep who, uh, um, or the sales rep rather, who, who is in charge of making decisions about whether to open up a new dealer or not. Uh, and um, 
it went something like this. I, I said, hi, I, you know, I've, I've got some interest in becoming a dealer. And he says, well, you know, um, you know, what, t can you tell me about what you do? I'm like, well, yeah, sure. You know, we, we sell primarily on the internet. And he says, okay, well, yeah, I'm probably not too interested in bringing on a new dealer. And I said, oh, is, is there a problem with internet sales? Do you not uh, like having sales over the internet? And he said, well, no, there's no problem. It's just, I've got two big dealers in the area already and combined, they, they do about uh, $600,000 worth of business with me. So I don't necessarily want to, you know, step on any toes. And I said to him, oh, well, I did 3 million last year and that was all vintage. And he said, you know, maybe you and I should get together and talk. <laughs> um, and that's, that's, that's literally how I remember it. That's not um, charm. That's brute force. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, we had a big vintage, um, uh, vintage business going on then. And our vintage business isn't quite as big as that anymore, but it's still a very large and important part of our business. Um, uh, was the vintage niche part of the deal that you managed to, to find a niche where you could be successful to move your way in? Yeah, I think it, I think it was. And, and I was able to really develop this track record of doing, you know, seven figures a year. That's, that's a, that's big business by anyone's standards. And having that level of business that I was already doing was something that, that gave these companies the, uh, um, I think sort of the confidence to to sort of bring me on and see what I could do for them. Mm -hmm. um, and once once I was in uh, with with those dealers, um, you know, it's it's really it's really all about relationships at that point. And you know, we've we've maintained great relationships with our um, with our partners, and um, they've really come through for us on many occasions. So it's it's a it's a very symbiotic relationship that we have. Well, it raises the question, how did you get to 3 million in vintage instruments by yourself? That's pretty huge. I'm really not too sure, actually. <laughs> could um, you put on somebody that knows the answers to these questions? <laughs> well, I was, I was, at that point, I had, I was aggressively buying vintage instruments. If I, if I thought I could make a hundred bucks on something, I'd buy it and, and resell it. Um, I had, I took a... I took a, uh, an approach to business that's different from what I think a lot of businessmen take. A lot of business, bu businessmen look to maximize their, their profit margin. Um, and I was not as interested in maximizing profit margin as I was in maximizing inventory turns. Now, the difference is if, you're, if you want to maximize profit margin, let's take, for example, a Selmer Mark VI saxophone. So it's a very collectible instrument. Uh, very in demand and and can command the right ones anyways some very high prices. So one of my competitors say might look to purchase one of these for four or five thousand dollars and then hold on to it for a year and a half until they get top dollar for their money, which might be as much as ten thousand um, dollars. And you know and they make a great profit that way and then that's a big margin. What I would do with that same instrument is I might buy it for the same amount, four or five thousand dollars, and then try to sell it in a month for six or seven. Uh, so my margin is lower, but my turns are higher. So I keep my money from being tied up uh, whenever possible. And what that does is um, that maximizes your um, your effective profit margin, uh, you know, over the year, your your yearly margin. So making 10%, having your money tied up for a month and making 10% is a better margin than having your money tied up for a year and doubling it, is what I'm saying. And you have more use of your money, of course. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, so that's kind of, the, uh, um, kind of the, the tack that we were taking. And we were, at the end of the year, our, um, our net margin was 6 to 8%. I mean, it was not high at all. It was it was quite low, um, but we uh, uh, but we did enough volume that it made it worthwhile. Uh, the reason that we actually made contact with the uh, um, the manufacturers was because of a dramatic shift in eBay's uh, fee structure, which uh, threatened to uh, to make our um, our old model untenable, and in fact, did make our old model untenable. Wow. So. Um, so you jumped so ship in time. I'm sorry? So you jumped ship just in time then. 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're still on eBay. We didn't jump ship from eBay, but we just changed the way uh, we, we sort of reinvented our business model. Um, so we're not able to do those extremely rapid turns anymore. So we do, we still try to turn our inventory as quickly as possible, but having having about a 90 day turn rather than a 30 day turn is more along the lines of what we have right now. And in some of our larger deals that we do, we have substantially longer than a 90 day turn. Like for instance, we, we can, we've done some bulk deals where we've had inventory in for well over a year, but you know, we know that upfront, we're going to sell, we're going to start selling it immediately and it'll just sell steadily over, over the, the following year. So I haven't actually calculated what our actual net turn is, but that's not really important for this discussion. Um, but it's, but it's a little longer than, than 90 days, um, which, which is what we shoot for. But, um, but yeah, uh, we, we did, we did sort of have to reevaluate how we were, um, how we were approaching the business, um, in order to continue to survive with, um, with eBay's new fee structure. And a lot of our, uh, competitors did not survive eBay's, um, eBay's fee change. And I'm not just not saying that uh, those competitors no longer exist, but they just found it no longer profitable to um, sell on eBay, which was our main uh, outlet at the time, and still is, to, to be perfectly honest. Um, uh, they uh, and a lot of them just went back to regular brick and mortar stores and uh, decided that it wasn't worth the, the hassle or the expense of selling on eBay. Since we did not have a brick and mortar store, that wasn't an option for us. So our options were either change or die. Oh. And so you managed to deepen your niche by paying attention to the conditions and altering them. Absolutely. Always have to pay attention to what's going on or you're going to get caught flat footed. Yeah. Well, um, do you think um, that the way you're thinking is good for all business people or just the business that you're in? Do you feel like uh, you're operating on sound business principles in general, or do you feel like it's really specific to your organization? Well, I, I think the answer is both. Uh, I mean, I think the, the principles that we do operate on are sound. I mean, buy low, sell high. That's a that's pretty much a universal in business. Um, you want to sell for more than you pay for. Um, at the same time, every single business is different, and you have to have an understanding of the niche that you're in and how you're going to effectively compete with your competitors in that niche in order to... Um, in order to to design your specific approach there are things that work for us that would not work for somebody else and there are many other very successful companies that have approaches that just would not work for us so um do you have an example so our, well um i mean brick and mortar stores are a great example um you know say for instance uh, music and arts they're a, a a fantastic chain of uh, musical instrument stores uh, throughout the country, they do great work and, uh, um, and, you know, have a really strong clientele and following, uh, one of their primary profit centers, uh, is through instrument rental. Um, you know, they rent beginning, uh, musical instruments to, um, to young, uh, young students that are just starting out and, um, maybe aren't sure if they want to continue with it or not. Uh, rental is not a business model that works with the way that we have uh, things set up for us right now. Um, I mean, I would love to figure out a way that we could do uh, instrument rentals uh, through the internet and uh, um, and not have you know physical location stores for people to come to and you know get their instruments and then have them serviced and such. But it just, I mean, there are there are ways that. It could be addressed, and there are some companies that actually do a pretty good job of that as well. But it it just seems like it's so much overhead and so difficult that it's not something that we are really very interested in in pursuing at this time because it would it would it would really drag effort away from our primary mission, which is focusing on the higher end brass and woodwind instruments and delivering them to our customers at really great prices. You don't have to be a musician to run a business like yours, and you certainly don't have to be a scientist. Do you feel like there's anything in the training you got in both fields that has assisted you in running your business? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, as being being a musician, the main, I mean, the, the number one thing that assists me in running my business is just that love of music. 
right? Um, uh, I love music and I understand the joy that music brings uh, to people who play it. And so that allows me to really connect, I think, with my customers um, better than, say, a non-musician would. Also, I've got a trained ear, so I know what to listen for. If I have a customer who happens to come in to try a few instruments, I can listen and I can honestly say, you know what, I think you sound better on this one, or I think you sound better on this one, or that's my opinion, or, or maybe if, that's, you know, if there's a sound you're looking for, you should try this one over here that you weren't even thinking about. Um, so that, that sort of, it sort of helps, helps me there. Um, also as a, as a musician, I, I appreciate playing a quality instrument myself and I want that for all of my clients. And so that has led to our, um, sort of unofficial model of we don't sell junk. Uh, basically, um, there are instruments out there that are garbage and I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want to get sued into the ground, but, um, but we don't carry any of those. Uh, every instrument that we carry is something that we believe in. Now, not, they're not all of the same quality. We have some lower end instruments as well as some higher end instruments, but the lower end instruments that we have are solid lower end instruments that are good for what they are. You know, they will serve their purpose. If you're a beginner, this is a great beginning instrument, something you can learn on for two or three years before you're ready to move up. Uh, if you're a professional, our professional instruments are fantastic and you will love them. Or we'll take them back. You know, we've got an unconditional uh, satisfaction guarantee on everything we sell uh, so that you don't have to feel nervous about, um, uh, about buying a, an instrument over the internet, uh, which I know a lot of people do and with good reason. Uh, so we try to take that out of the uh, equation by saying, you know what, if you don't like it, send it back. Yeah. We'll, we'll take it. Other than being very intelligent, nobody would guess the level of expertise you have in microbiology. I mean, you really know your stuff and it's not coming up at all. Where is that in the mix? Oh, well, that's maybe a little less important, um, but I do feel like... Uh, you know, the actual microbiology plays a very small role in uh, um, selling musical instruments. But the, the more rational approach to thinking um, and, you know, having sort of an evidence-based evidence outlook really is important. And I'll give you, give you an example uh, there. Um, you know, back when I was doing primarily vintage, uh, there is a, uh, um, uh, a vintage saxophone that I just love the way it sounds. It's, it's the Martin Committee model, uh, fantastic instruments. And, you know, a few players um, actually do play these. I think the, uh, um, I believe the tenor sax player for, um, for uh, Stay Human, the band on the Colbert Show, plays a Martin Committee, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyways, they are, in my opinion, one of the best sounding uh, vintage saxophones out there. And so I would buy them whenever I got the chance. And then I would sit on them for months and I could never make, a, make any money on them. I'd always end up selling them for about what I paid for them. And I eventually had to sort of take the evidence-based approach, which is that even though I personally love these instruments and think they're great, the market just doesn't exist for them. And so I've, uh, um, or rather, it's not, it's not what I want it to be. Uh, so I don't really uh, buy those too much anymore unless there's a really good deal to be had on one. Um, because, you know, there, there's two sides of the coin. There's appreciating the instrument, which, you know, is, is a big part of what gives me satisfaction. But at the end of the day, we're a business and we need to be in it to make money. So um, if... If I, uh, if I keep buying, you know, great saxophones that nobody wants, I'm not going to be able to afford the great saxophones that people do want. So, um, so just, you know, being rational and putting my own feelings aside, I think my scientific training has really helped me sort of take that angle. That's a great answer. What makes an instrument great? When you found, it was a Selmer you were talking about at the beginning of the story, right? Sure. What what was that experience that you had? What is in what in a brass or wind instrument is tremendous and gives you that fantastic feeling? Oh, you you mean my trombone? That was a con. 
Oh, okay. So I guess yeah. I, yeah, what, what I'm asking is, yeah. yeah, what is a great instrument? Well, for that particular instrument, and so what makes a great instrument is different for everybody. Uh, and it really depends on what kind of a player you are and what you're looking for. Um, but what I really, what I, I, I think what it really comes down to is a great instrument helps you sound like you um, rather than like somebody else, for instance. Um, and, you know, what, and, and, and it's an internal thing. Like when I played that, that 88H for the first time, uh, I felt like I'm, my tone quality wasn't quite as dark as it was on the Bach, but it was just so easy to to navigate the upper register and it was so clear speaking and it just it just connected with who i was with a, as a player um and so it it would it helped me to be me i mean you're going to sound like you no matter what you're playing um but the question is does your instrument help you sound like you or does it hold you back from sounding like you and so that's what we try to do is we try to hook people up with instruments that help you sound like you. Um, and I said to a, a, someone on, a, on a, a, a Facebook discussion a while back um, how he said that he, uh, um, you know, he played an old Vito saxophone and he, and he loved it and didn't see any reason why he had to, um, why he had to, uh, you know, buy, buy anything more expensive. And I said, you know what, that is great. If you sound great on a veto, you should be playing a veto. And a veto, just uh, for your listeners, um, is, is a good, solid, high quality student level instrument. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a solid horn, but it's not usually the choice of professionals. Um, but this guy, he sounded great on a veto. So that's the horn he should be playing. That's the horn that made him sound like him. Will you talk about your two teachers, Per Brevig and Ray Premru? Uh, it'll be helpful for folks to know exactly why they're great and you know, also what they gave you. Absolutely. So I'll start with Per. Um, per is, um, he, so he was formerly uh, the principal trombone uh, of the American Symphony Orchestra under Leopold Stokowski and then became the uh, principal trombonist of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. And uh, um, Per is a Norwegian uh, who was just a, he was a really fine trombone player and a, a fine teacher as well. Uh, he, uh, um, I met, uh, Per was my, my first teacher and I met him um, you know, my first year at Oberlin and um, he really helped me around some technical problems that I was having and all, but more importantly, uh, you know, I learned, I learned two things, uh, two major things from pair that didn't have anything uh, to do with trombone playing. And one was, or the first one was, uh, if I'm not good enough, I need to try harder. And the second one was, uh, and this is one of the most important lessons I ever learned um, as a musician was how to take criticism without feeling personally attacked. Uh, because Pear had plenty of criticism for me, <laughs> and it was and it was all deserved. I learned an awful lot from him, and I improved an awful lot uh, under his teaching. But but I was a mess when I came into <laughs> came into Oberlin, and Pear had a lot to say about it. And you know, it's hard to be a college freshman. And come, you know, and, and having been this big trombonist from this little town in California, uh, and then coming in and having this great big trombonist uh, tell you that everything you're doing is wrong. Um, I mean, that's not exactly it, but but you know, the first few lessons there was a lot of criticism, and you know, if I had if I had taken all of that as a personal attack, I would have just been you know personally devastated. And I you know I realized he's trying to help me. Criticism is helpful. If you can take it like that, um, you know, and and not everybody has you know altruistic methods with it or uh, uh, 
uh, intentions with their criticism all the time, of course. And people can be mean, sure, but uh, but you have to recognize when people are trying to be helpful and and take that in the spirit that it's given. So um, that was really, I think, the number one thing I took from care outside of um, you know more technical uh, things that we that we discussed. Uh, and and I will also say about pair um, when when I I uh, when I took a, a piece that I had worked on over winter term into our first lesson back and that he did not know I was working on and I played it for him and after I was done he simply said bravo. That was perhaps the finest compliment I've ever received musically in my life. Um, so that's that's the flip side of having someone who's really hard on you is when they appreciate the work you've done, it means so much more. Now, Ray Premru, on the other hand, well, not on the other hand, uh, but moving on, Ray was, is, was he, he's since passed away, unfortunately. Um, Ray was one of the finest people I've ever known. Uh, what a kind and generous man, um, generous with his time, uh, generous with his knowledge and wisdom, and what an amazing bass trombone player he was. Um, I mean, he had a sound that uh, just could not be beat. Um, and Ray... Ray started off uh, his his younger career as a tenor trombonist. He was, I believe, a student of Emory Remington at the Eastman School. I, I might be misremembering that, but I think he was. Um, and he took a trip over to England um, to to do two auditions uh, at England. And I, if I'm if I'm misremembering of this, any of Ray's students, I'm sure will will call in and. Uh, um, and correct me, but I think I'm right about this. So he, if I'm remembering correctly, he he took two auditions in in London: second trombonist for the London Philharmonic, and bass trombone for the Philharmonia. And London is is of course blessed with, I believe, six uh, professional level uh, symphony orchestras. It's the most of any uh, city in the in the world. Uh, is London Symphony, London Philharmonic, Philharmonia, Royal Philharmonic, and then the two opera orchestras. Um, but, uh, uh, but Ray took those two auditions and he won them both. So he had his choice of which job he, he wanted. And he did the bass trombone, um, audition on a tenor trombone on his 88 H that he was playing at the time. And they said to him, okay, we'll give you the job, but you have to buy a bass trombone. So, so he went out and bought a bass trombone, and, and he he bought a a great Holton TR one sixty nine that he played for almost his entire almost the rest of his entire career. I believe he he switched to a different a manufacturer um, for the last few years of his of his life. But um, but that that Holton TR one sixty nine is a uh, uh, a very highly sought after and rare vintage bass trombone. And um, and, a, and a very fine instrument, but but Ray was Ray was just he just exuded he exuded music. Um, you know his his level of understanding of the, of musical phrases just seemed innate, and he uh, he really brought he brought that to every single lesson I ever had with him. And uh, one thing I remember about Ray is we would always. Um, we would always start our lessons with a duet. Uh, he had these Renaissance duets that um, were easy to sight read and just just fun for us to play together. And so we'd always we always play a duet. And I remember saying once to him, "You know, Ray, I sound so much better when I'm playing with you than when I'm playing in a practice room." And he said, "Well, I hope so." <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, he was he was like he was like the uh, um, he was like. A, He's like a Magic Johnson kind of player, if if the basketball analogy works. Because I feel like Magic Johnson on on the Lakers, he brought everyone's game up a notch. And when you were playing a duet with Ray or playing in a section with Ray, your playing came up a notch. 
just by having him around and having that musicality around you. And, uh, and it was a really great and valuable experience to be able to study with him. And uh, yeah, and I wish he was still with us. Do you feel like as a boss, you are that kind of boss where you're trying to up the game of the people who work for you? I try to be. Uh, I try really hard. Uh, whether or not I'm successful, you'll have to ask my employees. Uh, but Put I them really... on. Let's, let's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, most of them have gone home. Well, I, the, the, tech, the tech group is still here. But um, yeah, I think um, I, I really feel like I am. Um, you know, I've, I've done my best to cultivate a working environment here that people enjoy being at. Like, I don't ever want anyone to come to their job and think, man, I've got to go to my job again, or at least, or at least consistently. I mean, everyone's going to have days like that. Sure. But, uh, but I don't want anyone to wake up day after day after day, dreading coming in here and doing their job. So we try to make it fun. Uh, we, you know, we work really hard. And so, um, I, I, I try to make sure that, um, you know, we, we break it up sometimes, you know, every few weeks we, we hold an all company meeting where, uh, I just, well, we used to go to this barbecue joint, but, uh, more recently I've been, um, uh, getting barbecue and bringing it in, but, but where we have barbecue and we just sit around and talk and eat barbecue and drink a couple beers and, uh, um, and discuss any issues that we have, or we just enjoy barbecue, you know, it's, we try to have have a little fun, and days like those make the days when the thirty pallets uh, from one of our uh, partners show up, and they forgot to order a lift gate for us. And yes, this actually happened. Uh, <laughs> you know, it makes those days a little easier to take. So I say enough good things about them. Uh, they they knock it out of the park every single day, and uh, so. So am I that kind of boss? I sure hope I am because uh, I, I want to do whatever I can for my people uh, to make their lives easier and happier and, um, and just great. So, so maybe yeah, well, <laughs> I, I guess keep working at it. What I'm suggesting perhaps is that uh, Mr. Premru uh, served as that kind of a mentor for you in that way so that even if you don't feel like you can be that good every day that's what you're striving for that in a relationship with the people who are with you so that when they're doing sales with you they do them better than if they were doing them themselves maybe yeah absolutely i mean i i don't think i've made that connection but i i can definitely see that that could be a yeah well, uh, I don't need to tell people where they can find you because I mention you every single time we do an interview, but I'll say it once more. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I'll let you. You tell them. Where can they find you? You can find us on the internet at www.brassandwinds.com. Sign up for our mailing list. We've just got our email list uh, going, at, uh, and uh, we send out specials about once a month or so, so you can be on the look for those if you're on the, if you're on the mailing list. Um, you can also... Find our um, uh, find our uh, uh, products available on either eBay under the sales name Quinn the Eskimo, or on um, Reverb uh, also under the sales name Quinn the Eskimo uh, Brass and Winds or Quinn the Eskimo Vintage Horn. I'm not sure which one we are there, um, but uh, or you can just give us a call at four two five four zero eight zero three nine three, and we'll be glad to answer your questions and. If there's a horn you want, we'll be glad to send it out to you. And we know the phone works. <laughs> the phone works. Yes. <laughs> Matt Stecker, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for all you do for us, too, at the Willow School in Truer MU. We really appreciate your support. It's our pleasure. And thank you. Uh, I had a great time uh, doing this interview. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks. And <laughs> there's our next <laughs> caller. <laughs> um, okay. I'll, I'll let that ring out before I finish up here okay. Three ringy dingies. i'm sure i can mute it somehow but. <laughs> it's a little late now i'm sure there's a way to do it <laughs> okay this is so exciting good. okay all right thanks very much for joining us on this one uh this was a real pleasure and if folks again if you have questions for me if you for some reason can't figure out how to make your way to brassandwinds.com contact me at willowschoolga.com or truermu.com 
Uh, we're looking forward to sharing more interviews with you. We've got lots of great guests on our way. Please like our interviews. Please share our interviews. And if you have any ideas for folks you'd like to see us talk to, let us know. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.